Good morning. It's summer. Can you feel it? Nice and thick, whether it's morning or afternoon, it is summertime. Uh, pastor Rick, who is our senior teaching pastor, the one who's usually on stage, is uh, down in Arkansas. He's done a wedding and he's, I don't know, hanging out with family. His kids and uh, granddaughter is uh, down there and we've been talking. They're doing great. They'll be back next week. But um, I'm uh, Dan, I'm on the pastoral team and I get to talk to you today about a fun topic, but... Let me tell you this, I need to tell you a little bit of a secret. I need to be perfectly transparent. So can you just keep it between us and our online audience? All right, I am from Memphis, Tennessee. Most big cities have a you know, pretty big zoo and we did in Memphis at, as well. And um, growing up, my dad, like I did, let me watch with him some shows back in, you know, a million years ago that were probably before I could really grasp reality. I don't know what it is about dads and our kids. We want them to be five years older than what they are. So I'm watching these Westerns back in the day, right? With my dad. Um, and of course there's, you know, there's gunfights and, and the West was rough, right? I mean, and there's grizzly bears who attack and there are wolves who attack all the time. So as a um, five or six year old, not a 15 or 16 year old, just wanna get that straight. It was five or six, I was really, really small. I had this fear and their fear was very logical. The fear was that the Memphis Zoo that I had attended many times had grizzly bears and wolves. And when they escape, you and I both know they smell fear and they're gonna make their way to my room. Now it's a 30 minute drive, so maybe they hop the bus, I don't know, but they're coming to my room because I am deathly scared of grizzly bear, bears and wolves. So, um, when we were growing up, my brother's 13 months younger, so you know, we're fighting, so we gotta have beds on two separate ends of the room, right? One on one wall, one on the other wall. And this fear is not like a, uh, having nightmares, it's haunting me, like I know they're coming. It's just a matter of time, right? I mean, it's logical. So what do I do? I don't just get scared. I get out of my bed. I go to my brother's bed, get between him and the wall, push him a little forward because we all know if they eat him first, I get time to escape, right? I mean, that's logical. It happens. And not again, that that wasn't too long ago, but Lori and I do a lot of travel and we stay in hotel rooms with kids, grandkids and business. And so she has heard me say, and just the other day, as I was talking about this, evidently she hasn't picked up on this story. So I asked her, well, we're in a hotel room, honey, which side of the bed do you want to sleep on? And if she chooses the one next to the door, I will say, you're going to get eaten first. <laughs> not that it's still, you know, worried about grizzly bears or wolves coming, but it is a funny thing the foolishness of fear. Now we all have fears. If we're gonna be transparent, I went first. So let's talk about your fears. How many are scared of like water, deep water, rushing water, anybody scared of water? Okay. How about um, heights? I, you know, past 10 feet, you better call the fire department with a ladder truck because you're not getting me down off of anything. And it's weird because I'm tall, but heights don't work. If I'm on a roof, I'm on all fours like a cat, man. And I'm not coming up at all on my, just my feet. Um, the youth, our middle schoolers just came back from camp. Yes, phenomenal time. High ropes course, not in your life. Going into caves where it gets close. Anybody claustrophobic? Me neither. I'm going into an MRI for the first time in a couple of few weeks and you may hear a scream from West Des Moines all the way out here to Ankeny. I don't know, but I don't like it. And you, have some fears the same way. And fear can make us do some foolish, crazy things. It's uh, interesting, Cornell University literally said, and this will put your mind at ease, 85% of those things we're fearful of never happen. Fact, not theory. So where did fear start? I mean, is it just recently because of our climate and our culture. And no, no, it started a few years back. We know it as Genesis, right? So Genesis, God creates the heaven and earth. Genesis two, he creates Adam and Eve, which is us humankind. And I would love to tell you by chapter 16 or 33, we finally mess up. 
Nope. We're created in chapter two. We screw up in chapter three. And don't laugh. I mean, because we would have been the same way. Adam and Eve, you get everything you want. You're empowered by God. There's a perfect relationship. In fact, I'm going to empower you to be over all the animals. In fact, you can name the animals. Life is great. Hey, don't do one thing. And we'd be like, what's that, right? I mean, that's our human dynamic. And he says, don't eat from the tree of knowledge because bad things are going to happen. And Adam and Eve did what they weren't supposed to do. So here's what, um, you know, here's where the first little fear comes in. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Now he's not lost. God knew what happened. So he's like a parent would when your kids are in trouble. You don't go home where my kids are. No, you go looking for them. Where are you? He answered. And here's Adam. I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. And we were naked, so we hid. And if Adam's like me, he probably pushed Eve a little bit forward, right? Because in case God zaps her or eats her or whatever he might do. But it is crazy to think the fear or the assumptions that come in our mind. Now, for me, the funny part is how did Adam and Eve know to do that? Like there was no podcast, no reel, no book to say, what do we do when we're freaked out, scared? And what is God going to do with us? Well, they did what we do. We call it sometimes a human dynamic. We hide, we have assumptions, we get scared. Let's talk about a foundational component, a, a definition of fear, if you will. So fear, some of us have heard the acronym of the false evidence appearing real. I would tell you that um, I wanted something that would hit a little harder. So my wife has a superpower. I'm, I'm like two hours wrestling with, okay, um, the false evidence appearing real. And like, honey, this doesn't like stick to where I wanted to land. And like in two seconds, she goes, how about false evidence um, altering reality? And I'm like, boom, how do you do that? I wish I had that superpower because as we laugh about water and heights and clowns, I don't, I don't get that one, but you know, whatever your fear is, that's funny. But I'm talking about some fears that can literally alter our reality. In fact, to give it a little bit of definition, this is a definition I use. It's an event because some of us have had a situation. We've had an experience, this thing took place, it was horrible words were said, maybe a, a horrible act happened to you and there's an event that we hold on to. Sometimes the rest of our life or it's an assumption. I was talking to a couple of you guys after the first service and before the second service about fear. I don't know why. Second service doesn't even know what I'm preaching on. But we have assumptions. And what are assumptions? They're made up stories. But the problem is we own them as real and true, don't we? You're not bought in yet. So here's my question. Um, you lose your job. I've lost my job. Anybody's lost their job because of downturns, economic situations, bad bosses, you name it. When you lose your job, now it may be for a moment, you might say, good, I'm, I'm out of here, thank goodness. But then what happens? Assumptions start to fly, do they not? I won't be able to find another job. I should have gotten a master's. Um, I'm not gonna find a culture. I'm too old, I'm too young. All those false narratives, all these assumptions start to plague our minds. And we treat them with stress. Sometimes you guys, I've heard of some people, they start selling things, marketplace left and right, cars were downsized. Like literally those assumptions alter our reality. You have to move, move for work, for whatever the reason is. What about the school systems? What about the interest rate? Kids will never have friends like they have here, right? All these assumptions happen and we believe them as true and real. And then there is the parent or authority figure that said something to you or did something to you that didn't just bounce off of you, it landed. And you own that word, that phrase, that act in such a way that that alters your reality. Some of us remember back in grade school, a person, a group of people said something about your looks, the what you did, what you don't have, and that has stuck with you. In fact, you are going back to that thought right now because you remember that. And the enemy loves to put hooks in those 
And that false evidence, it's not true. We want to act as if it is, and it can alter our reality. So what's the opposite of fear? Most of us say courage, but I would say, you know, son's a state trooper. We've 30 years, we talk to people, first responders. Most courage, I would say, is that they understand the fear. They're not not fear when bullets are flying or you got to deal with some altercation or there's a house burning down, but you've learned to walk and talk yourself through it. Or we've watched and listened to people on the news that they just weren't aware of the fear. And so they did it. They acted. So here's why I, I say that. Let me propose that the opposite of fear is love. You see, that's weird. Well, look at first John four. And here's why I say that. First John four says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is, he's not a characteristic of love. It's not like a, a nice picture. He is the definition of love. So think about that. This is, uh, um, hmm, this is sent his one and only son. I missed that. This is how God showed us, man. I could read, showed. He didn't write a song. He didn't write a poem. He demonstrated, showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live, not barely survive. We might live through him. This is love. Oh, get ready. Here comes a definition. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And here's the phrase, the mic drop moment. There is no fear and love. But perfect love drives out all fear. You probably like me have read that before, but it was, again, it just felt the need, even on my own life, like what a statement. That there is no fear in love and that perfect love pushes or casts out all fear. And it sounds, again, it sounds a little Pollyanna, but let me tell you what I know to be true and you do too, is that as much as I was scared of grizzly bears and wolves, our family had a tradition. We did a camp out and a camp out in the showers back in the eighties um, was we would go into our living room with sleeping bags and from the fireplace. And that was our camp out. Rick talked last week in father's day about a strong man, soft heart. And that was my dad. He lived out what it was to be a man of God in every way, shape and form, not perfectly, but persistently without a doubt. And I knew that I knew that I knew that my dad loved me, loved our family. He's a hero and I'm not half the man he is even to this day, but I hope to be because of how he lived these truths out. And this is where I'm going with that. As much as he's not God, he was a great example of what it is to be a man of God. And in our campouts, not one time did I ever fear that the grizzly bears or the wolves were coming. Why? Because there is no fear. My dad is here and he's strong and he's loving and he's smart and he's resourceful because it's true. God is love. And that perfect love cast out all fear. So here's what I want us to, to, to focus on here just for this first part. So Dan, what if I'm still, feel, still fearful as a follower of Jesus? Why does fear still keep on creeping in? I'm glad you asked. There's two major things that I want us to think through, really, really think through. First is, wait for it. What is my view of God? View of God. Okay, listen, the hardest person I and some of our leadership help to transition to a relationship with Jesus, in other words, a proper interpretation of who God is, is people who grew up in church. You were told or given a God box, what God can and can't do, what our denomination says he can and can't do, and what you better do or don't do, or God's going to get you. Anybody grew up that way? Even if you didn't grow up that way, sometimes it was sort of caught that there's rules and regulations, that he's the whack-a-mole God, just ready to whack you when you get out of line. Or if you do it, he's gonna thump you so hard, your ears are gonna fall off. We have a wrong perspective of God. And 
And why do we bring that up? Why do we talk about this perspective of God? Because I've watched it for 30 years. And let me tell you, it's not those who don't know Jesus or have never encountered. That's, it's usually new and fresh and they walk into it. It's those who have some type of religious background that we have to throw away. We have to capture this box, throw it away and rediscover who God is. And if you want to know who God is, read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And if you read those gospels and measure up what you've been taught, who God is, you've got to say, okay, this is not right. This stoic mean outweighs a good and bad. That's not it. And the reason you've got to nail that down, because if you don't get the perspective, proper perspective of who God is, it's going to fuel your fear. Does that make sense? Because who we were taught God is, if it's not accurate, you're going to think, oh, I made the wrong mistake. I married the wrong person. I made the wrong decision. The rest of my life is ruined. And it's not true. First of all, you're not God. You're not bigger than God. God is sovereign. He's omniscient, omnipotent. He is God. You are not. You can't alter his plans. Joseph principle says what anyone means, even for evil. God says, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll trump that. We call it the Joseph principle. So your view of God is huge. The second thing is this. Do you believe who or what God says about you, me? What do you mean? Look, God never makes anything halfway. Everything in Genesis, when he made it, he said, man, it's good. He makes Adam and Eve, and even though they messed up, it's good. He pursues a relationship because he loves us. It's good. If my view of God is tainted, it it fuels my fear. If I look at all my inadequacies, if I compare myself to you, I always look less. And the enemy's like, yeah, think of yourself less. Compare yourself. Look at all your inadequacies versus the value that God created you with and for. Because you'll never live out your purpose and his plan if you believe all these truths, even in church, you've heard the testimonies, you've read it, and you just start, yeah, that's for him, that's for her, that's for them, but it's not, it didn't land with me. Pastor Dan, you don't understand. I'm like, I do. <laughs> the enemy has caused such fear in our life, it has altered reality. So I implore you, not that fear ever goes away, <laughs> But your view of God and the way you view yourself, how God has created you will taint the goodness of God and his plan for you. And fear, the false evidence, the lies will literally alter your potential. So in your Capital City app, I've got a lot of other notes and biblical examples you can look at, but Psalms 139 is a chapter that is just beautiful. If you haven't read Psalms 139, read it because... It's why God created you. It's a reminder that he loves you, that he's created you on purpose for a purpose. Let me read you a few verses. It says this, for you, cre for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. So when we read that full chapter, you can't not, how about that for a double negative? You can't not, not walk away knowing God has created you so intimately, so uniquely on purpose, for a purpose. So I wanna pray for us as we sort of let that truth of false evidence altering our reality and then reminding us that we gotta check our view of God, our perspective of God and his view of us, how we perceive God has created us. So I wanna come back and after a few songs, we're going to uh, wrap it up by reminding us of what is true because the truth will always expose the lies. All right, so false evidence appearing real, so it's not true. 
So let's talk about what is true. Ephesians reminds us of this. Now to him, meaning God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Now, pause. We're not talking about the Lambo and the house and the gated community. We're talking about a follower of Jesus who says, hey, God takes my life. I live underneath his will. And so when we do that, I'm telling you, God has plans for you and I as followers of Jesus that will blow your mind according to his power that is at work within us. So the first part, he, he, God wants immeasurably more. And you said, again, that sounds Pollyanna, but it's not. You as parents or grandparents, we want that for our kids and our grandkids. Do we not? That's not, that's not too outlandish that we can't comprehend. It's true. And whatever you and I want who love our kids and grandkids and want to see them succeed, God says, hey, that fails in comparison to my love for you. And at that point in time, knowing how I adore my kids and grandkids, I am in awe of that. And, and personally, I mean, take scripture out of it. I know that sounds bad, but regardless, my life, I spent the first 18 years in a marriage and in ministry and it all went away. I mean, everything, finances, home, where I'm from, you know, the worst nightmare. I wound up in Iowa with a 30 below zero. Memphis at 115 is okay with me. You guys have heard this story, but it's true. And I have the assumption that life will never be the same. I knew that I would be a second-class citizen the rest of my life because that's what church taught me back in the day. God perspective, be very careful. Make sure it lines up. So why do I tell you that? I tell you that from personal experience. The Bible calls it a testimony. It's a real life story. That if I knew what God was at work doing then with a wife, a family, a church, a business, the blessings, I would have lost a billion dollar bet that God had that plan for me. This verse literally got exposed and I know that God doesn't do anything on accident. So I'm not preaching to you something that I don't already know first hand to be true. But there's something else. You and I both know the enemy loves to whisper the fears, the false evidence in our life. He loves to bring that back whisper in my ear. What happened 12, 15 years ago? What happened to you in grade school? What that heinous, horrible thing happened to you as a child? And then, and then, because according to the power, that is God's power at work through Jesus in our lives. And this is what I mean by that. We get a choice. Love demands a choice. If we didn't have a choice, we'd be mindless robots. Love demands a choice. So here's the choice we get. And I hate it because I, I do and make dumb choices. But here's what happens. I get a choice to go back and grab my fear. Even as a follower of Jesus, I have the choice to go back and pick it back up. And believe that false thing, that false event is true. And that's the only thing that can compromise the power within us as a follower of Jesus. This is why I want truth to make sure it lands. This is not just a nice thing, it's a real thing, it's true. And if we own this understanding and mindset, it starts to trump the false evidence. In your church app, I have a whole, I don't know, 10 or 12 verses on how to deal with fear. It's, you know, scripture. I mean, Jesus did it. So I think we probably ought to do when it comes to memorizing. I can't memorize. I'm not that smart, but what I do is by repetition. So every one of us have a phone. I either capture a phone, put it in my background. So I see these verses all day, every day that starts to renew my mind. So Isaiah 41, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you with my righty, mighty right hand. That goes through 10 or 12 scriptures that you can just sort of capture and walk through that helps to expose those lies and embrace the truth. Here's something cool that, that I just 
I've read a hundred times, but it really jumped out this week. Um, the reason I am pleading for you to understand how God has wired you, made you, and created you for things that you want to keep your expectations here. And God's like, no, 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 I got things that's gonna blow you away. My life, living proof, yours is too, if you will allow the power of the Holy Spirit to live through you. But here's the ramifications of that. Look in Ephesians 3, 7, it says this. Pause for dramatic effect. There we go. I became a servant of the gospel. This is the apostle Paul talking by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, meaning the apostles, he's humble, that's cool. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. What mystery? We're about to hear it. Which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, check that out, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. Dan, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. So heavenly realms are those what you think they are. They're the angels, there's demons, and they're watching this plan take place, right? God creates us, we screw it up, but God is still loving us and making a way in Israel in the Old Testament and then Jesus in the New Testament and everybody's on the front row like the Olympics wondering what's next. Like Jesus comes, radical change, takes the temple down, destroys the temple, says I'm the temple, radical stuff happens and he lives out his purpose and mission. He takes the atoning sacrifice that we read. He, take your, he taught, took your and my sin, what I should have paid myself, but he took it. He endured the beating. He lived a perfect life. He's killed on a cross. He's buried, but he says, no, no, he rises again. And he leaves us with the Holy Spirit, but the heavenly realms are like, but, but now what? Jesus is gone. Jesus, what, what's next? The church, not 5990 Northeast 14th Street. We always, we talk in mean, churches like, where's that church? Uh, we talk about church as a building and an address. Guys, that ain't on purpose. That ain't what God's talking about. It's not what Jesus came for. He came for salvation. And I would tell you that a better word we know, and it's in scripture as people interpret it as church, but I'm telling you a better term that I think we would understand is a movement. A movement, it's not a building. This building could burn down. We could meet at my house, your house. A movement is the individual followers of Jesus living out everything we've talked about today. And the enemy wants to take you down and help you live this barely survivable life. And God's like, no, 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 it's not what I created you for. I mean, the dark season in my life, I almost believe these lives so much I took my life. That's how the enemy works. Why? Because they realize, oh, stink. Jesus didn't just take off. He gave us the Holy Spirit and created this movement that for 2,000 years has not stopped. It's done anything but grow, just like the baptism videos. One life, one marriage, one family, one community at a time. This is why it's so important that you understand how God has created you, that the enemy uses those fear tactics all the time, but letting the truth expose the fear. I had a, I just came, I wrote this as I was wrestling with this because this is not a feel good, you know, athletically slap you on the booty, get back in the game kind of thing. This is like, no, no, we all know what's about to happen in the fall. I mean, the, the political fun you know, commercials are coming, which everybody loves. Can't wait to see those take up 90% of our life. Um, but the hostility, the emotion, the accusation, it's coming. And so in that darkness, who's going to be the light? You individually, but us collectively create a movement. So just, this is, just listen, this is, so, we are individuals who are living out God's call in our lives, right? A follower of Jesus, I want to live out more than I can think or imagine. That's what God has called me to do because of the power that is, in, that is within me, right? We've read that. And doing so with many other individuals in a group 
Call it a movement, call it church. Hebrew says, do not forsake the assembling, the gathering together, not the building, but that's what we're doing today. And don't get me going. I'm a college athlete in all state. Don't get me going with sports. You're not gonna go back to them when it comes to saving your marriage and your family, hoping they're walking with God. If you're going to, and we are going to see God's plan, movement work, this has to be a priority. I know I'm stepping on toes, but I'm just starting. So hold on with me. So a movement that is passionately loving God and loving people, which is a great commandment, right? Loving God with all of our heart, loving others as ourselves, using our gifts and ability. First Corinthians 12 has got a whole chapter that God has because he's created you on purpose for a purpose, given every one of those gifts and abilities that actually start with the movement, not just your job, not just what you do on maybe an athletic field or in a team dynamic or at school. No, no, it's supposed to start in the body of Christ. So with your gifts and abilities, and then yes, I'm going there too. And then with your resources, Malachi 3.10 says, hey, listen, here it is. Test me. The only time God says to test me with your finances, which is the one thing that we think, ha ha, we control. And God says, why don't you test me and see if I will not open the doors of heaven? And then second Corinthians, it says, hey, listen, don't give it begrudgingly. Don't do it like the old Testament people did. They had to give it because they felt, no, do it cheerfully because you know who's really in control of your life, your breath, much less your finances. And just to be perfectly frank, Lori and I, we get paid by Cap City and we have a business and our first 10% goes here. We support other things and other people, but it starts here. So I'm not telling you something that we're not already modeling. And so is that true with the rest of our staff? So yes, I'm stepping on toes. And then ultimately, if we do all this, it impacts the lives of our family, our communities and beyond. Acts 1.8. Guys, all of the heavenly realms when Jesus died was wondering what's next. This is what's next. And there's a season coming that we have to be prepared to be the men and women of God, the families of God, and ultimately this movement that Jesus came for salvation, but he came to start this radical movement. And then as he talks about the group, the church, he ends this, right? So we can come to him, meaning God the Father through Jesus with freedom, with freedom and confidence. Freedom from the past sin, freedom from your past hurts and pains, freedoms from the things that's been said to you, about you, the circumstances of the past, they're over and even the fear of the future. Oh, what's to come? Listen, God's got it. There's freedom in that. And then you can come confident. You know why? <laughs> you may have heard this. Perfect love. It casts out, it destroys all fear. And who's, who's love, do you remember? God is love. And he showed it firsthand when he sent his only one and son to die for us. That's why we can come with freedom and with confidence, not in what you did, not what I have done, but in what Christ has done. Like we literally can go right to the father, no priest. You know, every morning and every evening, I either leave home or I go home and I never once, not once do I doubt whether my wife, Lori, loves me. I don't feel like I have to earn it. I'm not in fear. Oh my goodness, what might happen this afternoon? Because in that perfect love, and our marriage is based on love, Lord knows we got enough hurts and pains and hangups to know this God plan works. I never doubt. The opposite is true, that fear casts out love. And therefore you feel like you have to. And some of us going back to that understanding or perception is God is why you've got to nail that down. Perfect love drives out all fear and God is love. Now, not to, again, you know, Rick and I both are pretty pastor. We're pretty passionate about not being churchy, but real. You and I both know when you become a follower of Jesus, it's not, you know, rainbows and bluebirds on your shoulder. So the enemy, because his job is to distract us, discourage us, 
will bring those hooks and he will whisper in our ear. Hey, remember what you did? Remember what happened? Remember how people viewed you or what was said about you? And he, that little sucker he brings up, doesn't he? He brings up that kind of stuff too many times. And especially if I'm following Christ, because he wants that to be taken away from us so that we don't reach our God-given potential. So here's a phrase that I use when I'm combating those fears. Yes, when the enemy whispers in my ear, three simple things. It's God created me. These are just truths, right? And truth is not false. The truth exposes the false evidence. So this is what I tell myself. God created me. Psalms 139. There's a whole chapter that God created you on purpose for a purpose. God loves me. John 3, 16. Most of us have seen that or heard that. For God so loved the world. That sounds big, but he loves you. Put your name there. That whoever believes in him should not perish, go to hell, but have eternal life and have purpose. That's John 3, 16. He loves me. I know that. And then God has a purpose and a plan. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We quote a lot around here. Trust in the Lord with most of your heart. Nope. I trust in the Lord with everything that is within me. As we acknowledge him, he directs my steps, steps. He points my purpose and mission out. And as we've read Ephesians 3.20, it's always more, always more. Just like you want for your kids and grandkids, it's always more. So when those fears come in, this is what I say. God created me. God loves me. God has a purpose and plan for my life. Let's say that together. God loves me. God, I screwed that up, didn't I? Here we go. One more time. And I'll do it right this time. How about that? God created me. God loves me. God has a purpose and plan. I just repeat that. Why? Because that is true. And he exposes the false evidence. So that I live and you live a life that is not just survivable. It is in a supernatural thriving mode. And when I do that and we start to do this together, it's a movement that all heaven and hell has been watching and wondering. And this is it. For such a time as is coming, my friends, we need the church. We need you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, it's a maybe a lot today. And it's personal because there's not a single person in this room that does not wrestle with a fear. Many of us may wrestle with many fears. And Lord, it is not true. It's a false evidence, but Lord, we know it can alter our reality. So today we have heard truth. We know truth. We are reminded of truth that you so loved us, that you didn't just write a love letter, even though (laughs) you did from scripture, you showed us firsthand the definition of love. And yet you not only gave that sacrifice, you empower us to live a life that is so much more (laughs) than we can comprehend. I know it full well. And I pray these truths we talked about, Lord, that that, you are love and you drive out, you cast out all fear. So with that truth laying deep within my friends today, those that are online that are watching, Lord, may they wrestle with this truth and plant it deep within their hearts so that we can accomplish those things that all heaven is waiting and wondering. And we do so to, Lord, just to give our creator and our savior glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen.